Which plane sunk the most enemy shipping during the war for Britain? Which plane helped HMS Warspite achieve the longest shot for a naval gun? I know, I joined very fortunate with the shark was. It inspired the Japanese raid of Pearl Harbor on November 1940 at Toronto, a raid that caused more damage to the Italian fleet than the Grand Fleet managed to cause some 24 years prior at the Battle of Jutland. And of course, which plane struck the wound that would lead to the Bismarck to be sunk? Of course, you will have seen, and you will have seen the title. And you see it on screen here. It is of course the string bag, the fairy swordfish. Of course, this was my very first history video as well, so it's a bit of a redo video. A bit of a revisit, we could say. Why then did I have such a historic career? Why did a wooden and metal biplane made of canvas become one of the best naval attack aeroplanes of the Second World War? It was also one of the few planes that started before the Second World War outbreak and lasted until the end. While so many of its contemporaries were no longer in use. The start of World War II was a crossroads for technology. At the war's start, you have technology from the 1800s. By the end of the war, you had guided ordnance, rockets, jets, and so much more. The swordfish was born in the early 1930s, when it took its first flight in 1934 and it retired 11 years later in 1945. Ferry, an aviation company with a very rich history of naval aircraft, started to develop an all-new concept, the TSR-1, a torpedo spotter reconnaissance aeroplane. A self-financed private venture for sale to any nation that had it in their market Something that the company were doing for the Greek Navy and Navy Air Service, sorry, who were looking to replace their current fleet of the Ferry Mark III's. However, Greece lost interest in this plane, so Ferry sold the idea to the British Air Ministry, who wanted a catapult launch to spotters aircraft. With the TSR, what? Well, sorry, TSR one. Ferry gave the fleet air arm the added bonus of having bomb, mine and torpedo capabilities as well as an option for spotting too. On the 21st of March, TSR-1 took to the sky for the first time from Heathrow Airport, piloted by, by their chief test pilot, Chris Stowland. The plane handled well and was tested with the Armstrong Sidley Tiger radial engine, which was born from their car engines of the Jaguar. However, the Bristol Pegasus was the favoured engine and had a lot more horsepower to give. These proved successful, and in 1935, the Air Ministry ordered three pre-production models, now named the Swordfish. One year later, a production order was placed 68 Mark 1s were ordered and joined the Fleet Air Arm July of 1936. So let's talk about the plane itself. The Swordfish, although an outdated plane, seemingly as it entered service, was a rather advanced biplane. With a metal airframe, it was covered in canvas cloth. It mixed wood to some of its spars. The wings could be easily folded to make space for aircraft carriers and also other ships. With all its struts, spars and braces, it limited the pilot's vision quite a bit. The plane had a crew of two to three, pilot, observer and gunner. However, a fuel tank could be placed in the seat on the centre of the plane where the observer sat. 
The play was also variable and had many uses. Due to its great lift from the two wings, four wings you can count so technically, um, it had a very low stall speed and that made the plane very easy to fly and extremely forgiving as well. Um, although actually the very first test plane, the TSR, sorry, TRS-1, <laughs> sorry, I always get that hand the wrong way, um, did spin out and crash when it was doing spin trials, but the plane was extremely forgiving, and that's why the swordfish was never used as a trainer, because it was almost too easy to fly. The string bag, as it got nicknamed, could carry almost anything, hence the name. And I quote from one of the pilots, it was like a housewife's string bag. It could carry any of the groceries. Basically what they meant by that is it could pretty much carry any ordnance. The plane has two Vickers machine guns, one 7.7mm we can just see here in the front of the plane. A second is on the back of the plane for the rear gunner. As for ordnance, as mentioned before, this plane could carry almost anything. The plane could carry up to 1,500 pounds of bombs, torpedoes up to 1,500 pounds, mines, uh, which was about a thousand pound mine, and with the Mark II variant it had eight RP3 rockets attached to it, making this plane extremely versatile. Born obsolete, the Swordfish showed the world that sometimes the old technology is still needed. And that's the thing about the Swordfish, and that's why I love this plane. It was out of date, it was obsolete, it was no use anymore. It had come to a time in history where monoplanes were the new toy, where basically the biplanes were gone. It was their, their, day, their day had passed. Um, and it really just, they, they just managed to take the fight to everything. Their slow speed was actually one of their biggest advantages. Now, a lot of swordfishes were lost in the war, unfortunately. Around 2,800 were actually made, all in all. About a thousand of those were actually the Mark II variant. Um, but because of the low speed, a lot of German pilots would overshoot the plane. One of the uh, big advantages of the swordfish was actually in a dive. What would the swordfish pilots would do is just dive down when they were being chased by a Bockerwolf for a uh, BF-109. They would dive down to sea level and then just immediately pull just straight to the flat. None of the German planes had that capability. The swordfish was so easy to control you could do that. And the German planes would often just crash into the sea behind them. There were at least two or three accounts of that happening. The other thing about the low speed was the fact that German gunnery schools had trained their pilots to shoot German planes, and generally they were shooting sort of slightly older variants of the BF-109. Now they didn't have a huge amount of planes to shoot of course, when they were practicing it wasn't very often and they used dummy targets and things like that, but they generally kept them going at a speed faster than you know, 100 miles per hour. Of course you've got a swordfish here just pondering along with its uh, Bristol Pegasus engine at about 110 miles per hour. The gunners often had a problem of hitting these things because they were simply too slow. They gave too much lead to the aeroplane and just couldn't hit it. It was one of the biggest issues some of the gunners on the Bismarck actually had and it was a uh, known problem for some of the uh, some of the ship's gunnery and AAA skills. So what's it like in game? Well, the Swordfish is a very low BR, it's a 1.0 British bomber. It is the starter of the British bomber line, as I said prior. You have two 7.7mm Vickers, um, you've got the E, which is the main gun in the front, and then you've got the K, which is the gun on the back. Now, the E gun on the front has 600 rounds. The Vickers K, as you can see with the uh, round, sort of, uh, round ammunition bin on top, Ammunition, uh, sorry, there you go, well, the brain was not working there, the cylinder. Uh, that one has 576 rounds in it. I know, an odd number. You have a crew of three, which kind of don't need. I don't know why they got the first crew member, the observer, in there, because it's kind of pointless. They can't do anything in the plane. 
Uh, the Observer, of course, was originally in this plane because at sea, before radar was a thing, they obviously had no way of knowing where they were. So it was usually the gunner's job. So you, you notice a lot of naval planes have rear gunners. And the reason for that is simply because it gave the pilot a certain person that could actually map out the area as they were going so they could find their way home. The Observer in the Swordfish, well, purely for that role, he was there for the radio communications to observe where they were going and find their way home. But, as I said, doesn't do anything in the game. Other than gives you a little bit of extra armour from behind. <laughs> Now, the metal plane with a body of metal and canvas has no real protection to it. You do have a fantastic nine-cylinder Bristol Pegasus engine on board, however, and that thing has got quite a lot of power to it, uh, giving up to 840 horsepower on takeoff with a spaded plane. Uh, and you get to a speed of around 140 miles per hour. Tactics? It's best to use the universal belt on both guns with its AP and API rounds. The choice of payload is your four 250 pound bombs, and now these are general purpose ground bombs which drop two at a time, so when you drop them, you will drop one, both, both of them will drop at the same time off both wings basically to keep even. so you only get two drops of these. Being only 250 pound bombs, they're rather weak, so if you're attacking things like vehicles, you have to be very precise and make sure that bomb lands on target, you won't get much away from it, but you'll be able to take out a base with that payload at that VR. Now the secondary piece of ordnance is the 18 inch Mark 12 torpedo, which is a 1,548 pound torpedo, a very big torpedo, um, but it has an issue. The issue with this torpedo is it has a very slow speed for dropping, which is 174 miles per hour. Now it's not too bad when you're in something like the fairy swordfish, uh, but you can still have trouble sometimes and still be over speeding a little bit and have trouble with that. The drop altitude is also 344 feet, which is a very low altitude. So using this plane in naval battles, for instance, can be extremely hard. With only a range of 3.2 kilometers as well, it's not the longest range torpedo, and it also has a 50 meter range arming distance too. So it's very problematic in that respect. The torpedo is good though because it is a very shallow torpedo with only a depth of one meter before it sort of levels out, and it will sit at one meter. So it's very good in that respect, but in many others, it's not so good. So what we'll do is we'll just jump to the hangar now and we'll just have a quick look at the plane in this mode. So as you can see the Fairy Swordfish is, as I said, a very old looking plane with the three bladed propeller. The Pegasus engine just gives you fantastic power as well. The seating arrangement it, it is interesting. I probably would imagine that it would make more sense to have just the fuel tank there rather than having this extra gunner. Because one of the things that can happen is with crew customer crew customer with the crew customization, there we go, the crew. Uh, with the defensive armament, number of uh, firing points of defensive armament is two on this plane, but there's only one gunner, and that won't change no matter what, so you have to keep it as it is. So it, it's kind of an odd decision to keep it like that. Now training up your crew for this plane, what I would recommend is, this is actually one of my least cr trained crews, um, but is training up the weapon maintenance. You want to have this weapon maintenance up high because this is going to help the torpedo uh, make sure it goes straighter, it's going to make sure the bombs don't disperse quite as much and also you're going to get about 50% less chance of weapon jamming which is a huge help. Also reload speed helps a lot too. It will help your gunner reload that rear gun. The Vickers on the back is quite useful and you will probably get a couple of kills with it. It's not unheard of. Now, next up, you want to make sure you've got one experienced gunner, which you'll have by default. Um, firing accuracy, firing precision is an important one. Vitality is also important. For the pilot, vitality, stamina. And that's about it, really. Don't need G-tolerance in a swordfish. So, let's just take her out just for one quick spin in a test flight. Now, we're going to do this uh, with the torpedo. And we will go out and get this done. So, 
One of the things with the Swordfish is you will get some maps where you start on an aircraft carrier. One of the beautiful things about the Swordfish as well is it gives you good practice for an aircraft carrier start. Now before I actually do start this, uh, start this bit of the video, I just want to show you a little bit from a documentary and uh, yeah, just the riskiness of being a Swordfish paddle operator. The difficulty of landing on a match ship was mainly because of its pitifully small size. We had a wingspan of 45 foot 6 inches and the width of the deck inboard of the bridge was something of the order of 58 feet. It meant a lot of crumpled wingtips. The role of the batsman in our landing was one of dictatorship. We weren't in a position to judge the rise and fall of the ship or the role of the ship, whereas he could feel it through his feet. The poor old batsman was in a very vulnerable position. If the ship rolled to starboard once we were committed to a landing, the port wing of the aircraft went right over the point where the batsman was standing just at throat height. So for carrier starts, the swordfish is very easy to get used to, and also it's one of the few planes you actually do get put on an awkward angle as well. Because if you look right now, we're gonna crash slightly into the the, um, the bridge of this aircraft carrier, because our right wing's gonna clip it. So what you have to do is just keep your finger on the uh, left button for your, for your tail, and we'll just accelerate. And all of a sudden the plane will start moving. As soon as that happens, you let go. And you'll get up without any problems at all. So the Swordfish, of course, doesn't have any retractable gear or anything like that. But as I said, this thing is just so slow, you can basically turn incredibly easily. Because you almost stall in a turn, but it will keep going for you. It's a very forgiving aircraft. Now the last thing I really want to show you with this video, because this is the little bit of a how-to guide, is we'll just go for a torpedo run. Now we'll get a little bit of altitude before we do this. One of the other things with the swordfish as well, you can see here the front machine gun, the uh, the Vickers machine gun here with the 500 rounds. And as you can see, there is an ability to sort of clear jams. Unfortunately, we still don't have the ability to clear jams in these planes. Another thing that the swordfish did was radar testing. This plane did it all, and as I said, it could carry anything. The plane actually did some radar testing and had some radars fitted to, I think it was a Mark V variant, they called it. And yes, there was a swordfish with radar on board. The plane was never used as a trainer uh, by the Royal Air Force or the uh, Fleet Air Arm Museum, because, sorry, not Fleet Air Museum, Fleet Air Arm, because it was just too easy. So, say this is our enemy ship, this British cruiser here. Now, we we'll come in and we'll start diving at it now. Now you want to dive to try and get below the anti-aircraft fire. Unfortunately, that doesn't really work in War Thunder. But as you can see right here, we've already gained speed and we're over speed for dropping our torpedo. So we're just gonna wiggle left and right. We drop the torpedo, away it goes, fish is clear and it's gonna go straight into the side of the ship. It's very tricky to get used to dropping torpedoes. But when you get the hang of it, it becomes very easy. Now with that torpedo gone, I can show you the other trick of the swordfish. You will notice that the engine is overheating already. You can't run this plane at 100%. You need it about 97 to 96. But the other good trick about the swordfish is the sort of climb turn. So what we do is we just climb, still turn it round, and this thing will just stall turn instantly. You can turn almost on the spot. Now, if you actually get in a turn fight with this thing, you're not going to turn very quickly. As you can see, this thing is barely moving at the moment, but we've still got stability of the plane. Even in a sideways turn, we will lose it a little bit for a moment, but you can turn extremely well in this plane, and people forget that. People forget that the Swordfish, because it has such a high lift coefficient, can turn almost on the spot. And that makes it a very dangerous plane, because you can really catch the enemy out. Of course, with the single Vickers machine gun, you have to be careful. 
because it's not the easiest gun in the world and it doesn't have that much damage post penetration. However, with the planes you're going to be facing at your level, you're generally going to be facing planes that don't have any armour. So you will have a lot of pilot snipes, and that's the easiest way to get kills in this plane. So we're just going to go around, and we're going to go and do a carrier landing as well. So I'll just talk you through a quick carrier landing too. So what we're going to do is we're just going to get behind the aircraft carrier. You don't come in front way on, you come in from the back of the aircraft carrier. That's because generally the aircraft carrier is moving forwards, of course. Now, of course, again, another thing in War Thunder, there's no real water physics, so the ship doesn't roll left to right, so you don't have to worry about that, and you don't have to worry about decapitating your friendly signal flagsman. So we're going to come around. Carrier landings are one of those things that people will say are very tough or very easy, but what they are is they're something you need to practice. And the Fairy Swordfish is one of the best planes to practice in War Thunder with. It's a very good plane to get the understanding of the base mechanics of the game, especially for bombing and things like that. Landing on an aircraft carrier, you can really get the sense of the plane. Now, because we've got such a slow stall mechanic, you can see here the plane's actually almost stalled out on us just as we're turning. Now, the, the claw will go down, the hook will go down, your arrestor hook will go down automatically. But when you're landing, you just want to gently pull it in. You don't want to be going too fast. You've got to make sure you're not going too slow either. And you generally just want to gently touch down on deck. And we should catch one of the arrestor hooks there. Unfortunately, when you do catch an arrestor hook, you're generally going to damage your engine. Uh, that's the only downside of doing it. But it is a very easy plane to carry a land with. Now, if you miss the arrestor hooks, then you can always just power straight back up and go around for another try but it is a very easy plane to use. Okay guys, well I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, then give me a let, let me know in the comments below. If you've made it to the end, swordfish forever in the comments. The other thing as well is, please feel free to subscribe to the channel. Um, that's always welcome, and like, you know, that kind of thing. And please feel free to come join the Discord as well. We're always looking for new members, and we, we're a little bit of a chatty group there. Not a huge group, but we're, we're growing gently as we go. Alright guys, until next time, this is me, Screezilla, out. Bye bye.